Welcome to the Bytecode, where we look at smart contracts with the people who wrote them. I'm your host, Shafu, and today we're going to look at mean finance with Nicolas Shamu. Uh, Nico, thanks for taking the time, man. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Yeah, sure. Uh, so why don't you very shortly introduce yourself and introduce mean finance, uh, and then you can share your screen and walk us through the implementation. Yeah, sure. Hey everybody, I'm Nico. I've been in crypto since 2017, I think. Um, I started, uh, I mean, when Bitcoin boomed in 2017, I started paying attention to it. And so I mostly came for the money and then stayed for the tech. <laughs> um, uh, I loved what, what we could do with it. I mean, I come from Argentina, and mm. so the the ability to have money that no one can take away, away from you, that it's only yours, that you're your own bank, that really appealed to me. Uh, so I stay in crypto for quite a bit. Then in 2018, everything sort of calmed down. <laughs> but then in, in 2019, I joined the Central Land. To, mm -hmm. to work as a dev there. I really loved what, what we were building. I was part of the initial public launch. It was amazing. And then in 2021, I joined some of my friends, childhood friends, and we launched Mean Finance. We basically, we realized that on one side we suck at trading. <laughs> I mean, every, <laughs> every time I buy, the, the price goes down, and every time I sell, the price go, goes up. Uh, maybe if I did exactly what the opposite of what I want to do, I would make some money. So, but basically, because uh, we suck at trading, we are really fond of DCAing and just trying to relax and forget about the price action for quite a bit. But we we realized that there were no good uh, decentralized solutions for DCA at the moment. Um, even one of our co-founders was actually using BlockFi at the, at the moment. Um, so yeah, we know how, how that <laughs> ended. Um, so we, all, we decided we wanted to kind of build something that could allow us to DCA, but in a completely decentralized way without having to trust our funds to some entity. And that's where the concept of meme finance was born. I mean, just the possibility. We wanted to understand if it was possible or not to build something like that. There were some solutions, but they were very expensive. Because if you try, I mean, if you take the naive approach, that is, you, uh, you, I will take your funds from your wallet and execute your individual trades every day, then it can get really expensive really fast. Mm -hmm. And also you will need to take a big amount of fee or whatever to try to cover the gas costs. So we wanted to understand if there was a way that, we, that a way that we could make it scale. And so, yeah, basically that's where mean finance was born. We basically wanted to understand if it was possible or not. And we kind of started discussing it just like a like something friendly to understand if it was possible or not. Um, my friend pinged the idea to me, like, I, I remember it was like 6 p.m. We stayed at until 9 p.m. trying to figure out if it was possible or not. We say, okay, let's go home. It's enough for, for today. And <laughs> suddenly that same night at 11 p.m., I pinged him and said, hey, I think, I, I think we like we can make it, we can make it work like this, and so we we started like a video chat at late at night, and we say, hey, maybe this can work, and that's how we started. I mean, it was actually a side project, trying to understand if it was possible or not, and it turned out it turns out it was. <laughs> Yeah. So while so you can start sharing your screen. Maybe I, I wanna I wanna say uh, two things. I'm super excited uh, to have you on as our first guest 
for two reasons. Um, I love the product and it's one of the rare protocols in DeFi that I use on a weekly basis. So that says a, says a lot, I think. Um, and the implementation is really interesting. The smart contracts are really well designed. There are some really interesting concepts there. So uh, yeah, excited to dive in. Yeah, sure, let's do it. So this is basically um, something we built from for our audits. So basically we had quite a few audits and we wanted to make sure that the auditors got as much context as possible. So we have, I mean, I modified that a little bit, but basically I want to explain how we built I um, mean finance for it to scale because what we wanted to make sure is that we were able to execute all the swaps our users wanted us to execute um, but without having to without having to actually uh, incur in a lot of in a lot of gas costs so the, what basically what we built is we built it in a way that we can make it scale so no matter if we have one user 10 users or a million users in the same pair the gas cost would would be exactly the same that's what we wanted to do that's basically the core of what we've done and because we saw that a lot of different protocols on ethereum mainnet wanted or tried to build dca and failed because of gas cost i mean mm. so because that's mainly, I mean, it's not that hard to build a DCA tool. You just take some money and try to swap it for another token at certain yeah. intervals. Uh, but doing it in a way that you can make it work on Ethereum mainnet, that's the tricky part. On other, in, on other networks, it would probably be cheaper, especially networks like Polygon. Um, so that doesn't need that amount of scalability. But uh, it's also, I mean, we had some users trying to farm us or bot us or whatever. So because so sometimes we get like, I don't know, 5,000 positions created in an hour. Mm. That's mm. definitely not normal. <laughs> um, yeah. uh, there's not that many people in DeFi. Uh, <laughs> um, but yeah, basically, if we were to execute each swap individually, that even on Polygon, that could get really uh, expensive really fast. So basically, what I wanted to do is try to see if there was a way that we could make it work so that even if we have one user or 50 users or 100 users, that we could um, keep the gas cost low. So mm -hmm. let's drive into it. So basically, the product is what I already mentioned, Min Finance right now allows people to DCA from one year to 22 others. Basically, they can, they can create positions in the way of let's, I want to swap 100 die for ETH every day for 30 days. Um, each time a swap is executed, we take a fee, currently it's at 1.6%. Um, so if the, the user would swap um, 100 dive for, I don't know, 0.1 ETH, they would get, they wouldn't get part of the fee. I will then explain why we went with this fee, but this is basically why, how, what being finance does. Mm -hmm. The fine print is we have a few limitations. Uh, we have an Oracle that will also go into that. Um, mm -hmm. Tokens need to be white listed by us. Uh, this is mainly because to improve the user experience. I mean, there are two reasons. One is if we initially allowed everybody to DCA into any tokens, and that would uh, be a security concern from some of our auditors. We were had a vulnerability in one of our early versions that we, but I mean, it was disclosed th to us through Immunify and we patched it, no funds were at risk. Um, but at the same time, we realized that people were creating positions that couldn't be executed. <laughs> and mm -hmm. for example, there are some tokens that are available on L2, um, on different L2s, but there isn't enough liquidity for that swap to be executed. So 
you could technically create a position, but we wouldn't be able to execute it. Um, so you would be losing money. So basically what we say is, okay, it's going to be a lot of extra work for us, but let's try to do some due diligence on our side. And every time somebody asks for a new token to be included, we'll do the due diligence, look at the contracts, make sure it's okay, make sure there's enough liquidity so there, there isn't a big price impact, it can be executed, etc. It's a lot of work on our side, but we realized that we needed to do it so that everything work as expected. I mean, just to have the user experience be good enough. Yeah, and I, I remember from the implementation, you guys uh, tried really hard to support most ERC-20 tokens, right? But the problem with ERC-20 tokens is there are some really weird ones, which yeah. just introduce a whole lot of security issues. Yeah, yeah, of course. And I mean, do you have uh, uh, ERC-20 tokens that charge a fee or that yeah. um, are rebasing. So that doesn't work well with DeFi. <laughs> I mean, so we needed to take a look at it and understand how um, every token worked to see if we could uh, support it uh, directly or if we needed to maybe write a wrapper for it. So it, it, was, it was a little tricky. Uh, so we realized that we wanted to be as open as possible, but at the same time, we wanted to be able to guarantee a good user experience. So we add this, this white list. So basically when somebody creates a position, they will have, they will specify these five parameters, basically the token they want to sell, the token they want to buy, uh, the rate, that is how much of the uh, token they want to sell, will they, they want to sell on each swap, the amount of swaps, they want to execute in total and the swap interval. Um, and basically, once a position is created, um, they, it can be bonified, it can be terminated. Terminated means um, ending it and getting the funds that were swapped and the ones that weren't swapped back, and also withdraw whatever was swapped. This is everything that can be done once you create your position. And another interest, interesting aspect is that each position is actually an NFT. Um, mm. So we wanted to make it as composable as possible. So each position is an NFT that you can transfer to other users. And once you transfer uh, the NFT to other users, you can actually, uh, I mean, that is the new owner and that new address is the one that now has permission over has uh, ownership over your position and can execute all the actions I described before. And then we also went ahead and created a permission system on top of the on top of the NFT. So you could remain the owner of your position, but at the same time you could give, give other users or contracts the possibility to withdraw on, on your behalf or increase your position or stuff like that. We can we will look into it uh, later in the code, but just wanted to to bring it up. Like I said, if we have these permission systems, we can give individual permissions to individual addresses. And then, um, go, once your position is created, they need to be swapped. So the idea was, um, like I mentioned before, we wanted to aggregate all positions for the same pair. So basically, all positions that go from if to die and die to ETH, they will be on the same pair and we will <clears throat> aggregate all of them together and we will swap all of them together at the same time. Um, this means that this reduces a little bit the flexibility because somebody, for example, asks, hey, I want my position to execute it every day at 8 p.m. and another user maybe wanted to do the same at 8 a.m. Well, we, we currently don't support that. All positions are executed together at the same time on the same day, which is basically um, mostly at, uh, when the day starts at UTC time. Um, and so we aggregate all these together. And so we can have, like I said, like a million uh, positions on the same pair. But since we are aggregating all of them together, the swap is only one. Swap is only one transaction, so the gas costs remain pretty low. 
And the other aspect is that we have a, like an actor that we call a swapper that can execute the swaps. So the idea, we wanted to make it as decentralized as possible. So we don't have um, exclusivity on the ability to execute swaps. Basically, anybody can execute swaps. So our our we our guideline is, al is always I want to be able to uh, make sure that if I get hit by a bus tomorrow, <laughs> mean finance can still continue to work. <laughs> yeah, the famous the famous bus number, right? Yeah. Exactly. I mean, <laughs> hopefully, hopefully it doesn't happen. But if it does, <laughs> I want to make sure that mean finance continues to work. So basically. Yeah. Um, anybody can execute swaps and they, they will get, we have some incentives in place for them to do so. So basically the incentives are these four. Um, basically, since everybody can execute swaps, um, we need a price oracle that determines what the price of the tokens is. So we don't have to trust that person to just say, this is the current price. So since we have a price oracle, then uh, the swapper might be able to arbitrage our price against uh, prices on other DEXs. The other thing is uh, we, our swaps are actually flash, flash swaps in the sense that we expect, we have some amount of tokens that we need. We have some amount of tokens that we will give you as a reward for providing that, that amount of tokens. We will send you the reward optimistically um, and then you have to return the funds. So since we have, since you have the funds beforehand, uh, the world beforehand, then maybe you can do something interesting with it. Mm -hmm. um, we also allow support the flash loans. That is, when you execute a swap, you can borrow the entire liquidity during the swap for free. You will have to return it, of course, but you can get a lot of different, I mean, since you have more liquidity than needed, then maybe you can do some interesting arbitraging or whatever. So that also is an incentive. And the other thing is we share a portion of the of the fee with the swapper. Right now they get uh, three quarters of the fee to whoever executes the swap and we get one quarter of the fee. Um, so that's basically that's basically how it works. So just to recap, these are great positions. We aggregate all of them together. And then we have this actor that will execute positions. So the good thing is that with this new actor, People who create the positions want um, don't need to pay for the gas fees of each swap. Mm -hmm. That's pretty cool, um, and that's what makes Min more appealing and to to most users because the the gas cost to be involved in Min is mostly just make a deposit and then make a withdraw, and your funds get automatically traded for you. Yeah. Nico, maybe one question. Uh, if I remember correctly from your docs, isn't there like a time window for whitelisted swappers? Yeah, and yeah, yeah. We had... no, yeah no. Go ahead. No, no, go ahead, go ahead and finish. Yeah, uh, why, uh, why did you guys introduce that? That's a really good question. Um, so we added that in our, our latest version, I think. Um, because we realized that we wanted everyone to be able to execute swaps, but at the same time, we know that swaps aren't always profitable. So let's say mm -hmm. that you are on Polygon and you want to swap, I don't know, one die for ETH for one year. Or Polygon is actually fairly cheap, but let's say you are in, in Ethereum mainnet and you want to, you want to swap one die for ETH, um, uh, each day for one year. Executing that swap will probably take, I don't know, 20, I mean, between 10 and $20 just to execute that swap. Um, so if there, are, if there are pairs where that don't have enough volume, then it can get um, unprofitable pretty fast. Mm -hmm. um, as, as long as there is enough liquidity, everything will be good and over, probably most people would be happy to execute the swap. But if there isn't enough volume, then <clears throat> there won't be. So basically what we did is we, re we realized that some people were executing profitable swaps 
and they will, but nobody was executing uh, the ones that weren't profitable. But at the same time, we wanted to be able to guarantee <clears throat> uh, to guarantee that all swaps would be executed. So basically, we were left with unprofitable swaps while people were taking profitable swaps. So mm -hmm. what we said is, okay, let's do something that um, let, let what went to make a small change that would help us in this situation. So what we did is we introduced a time window where widely still swappers can execute with between that window. Um, so basically us or other people can execute both profitable swaps and with those profits that we can also execute unprofitable swaps. We wanted to make an, another change in the future in our new version where actually the fee won't be fixed and it will be automatically changed over time. So basically, let's say we charge a 0.6% fee. So how much the protocol will take and how much the, the swapper will take will change automatically as uh, over time. So if you execute it really quick, the protocol will get more of the fee. And if you get it executed later in time, the swapper will um, get more uh, a big part of the fee. So basically, <clears throat> people will wait to exit to until the fee for the swapper is big enough for it to be profitable. But at mm -hmm. the same time, we could execute it earlier if we want to and execute unprofitable pairs with that. So that's basically the more complex approach we wanted to, to go with. But in Web3, we, we try to keep changes as small as possible <laughs> until you do a big overhaul. Um, so that's why I introduced it like these, these privileged swappers. But at the same time, I mean, this is only for a small window of time. I think it's a third of the window. So basically, again, if we get hit by a bus, <laughs> if everybody on the main team gets hit by a bus, yeah. then swaps can still be executed by anybody and mm -hmm. still will, will work correctly. But yeah, that's a really good question. And that's why we introduced that, that, that change. Okay, got it. Okay, so diving into the architecture, this is more or less how we how we build how the architecture works. We've made some changes over time, uh, but this is more or less how it works. So basically, we have what we call the DCA hub. It's only one contract. I'm gonna go into it in the next slide. Um, that contract, when they need to act for quotes, has an Oracle aggregator that currently supports Chainlink and Uniswap V3. And then <clears throat> um, the DCA have, we have a permission manager contract that we'll go into it in the next, uh, next slides. Um, that the permission manager basically tells if a caller has permissions to operate on a certain on a certain position or not. And we also have an NFT descriptor that's, this is actually pretty cool. It's basically a contract that um, on chain uh, generates an SVG for your position. So we don't yeah. have to, so we don't need any, any servers or anything that, to show your position. It's everything on chain. So you will, we, you have an NFT with an image that shows the current state of your position. That's actually pretty cool. Yeah, um, yeah, it's it's super cool. It's super cool. So basically, you render the SVG on chain. This exactly. Very, very. Yeah. I mean, it was completely based on Uniswap V3's idea. I mean, kudos to them for the ideas, but we loved it and we wanted to do something similar. Yeah. Um, so basically, they have going back to V1. Basically, we have different contracts for each pair. Mm -hmm. uh, this, um, this hindered growth because creating new pairs was fairly expensive. We weren't using um, minimal proxies or anything at the time. So it's very expensive to apply a new contract each time. Mm -hmm. But so we basically said, okay, what happened if we hold all pairs under the same contract? Um, we we went with that idea basically because of two reasons. On one side, we eliminated the need 
to deploy new contracts. But also we realized that it, it would be easier for us or to, for anybody who wants to execute a swap to execute multiple swaps from multiple players in one transaction, transaction if the funds were all together in one contract. So basically, for example, let's say um, you have you have two pairs. One is DAI ETH and the other is DAI, I don't know, uh, wrap BTC. So basically, um, you you have you have one one of the tokens you will need and the other you have an, an extra. So basically, we realized that if we could combine the two pairs since they share one token in this case DAI, maybe we could find some coincidence between them and reduce the amount of liquidity we need from external so sources. That would make everything, I mean, executing swaps a lot cheaper um, mm. because we need, um, we don't need to go to many, uh, to other sources to, to find liquidity. At the same time, it will be uh, better for the, for the swapper because if you need to find liquidity on other sources on chain, they also charge a fee and you need to pay that fee. But if we, if everything gets sorted out between pairs in mean finance, then you need less liquidity. So you don't have to pay a fee for the liquidity that you, that you manage to, that you manage to overcome here internally. So that's basically why we built the hub. So basically, the hub, um, like I said, has different uses. Uh, you can create position, um, you can execute swaps, you have some configuration, like like fees and the ability to pause and unpause the contract. When we have, when the admin can pause the contract, basically it it uh, pauses deposits and swaps. But it, of course, won't pause withdraws. Nothing can pause withdraws. <laughs> That's very important, of course. That's good. That's good. Yeah. Um, then the permission manager. Ideally, it should be a part of the hub, but we run out of space. <laughs> um, Contract size limit twenty four k. Okay. Yeah. 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 So basically, we couldn't. Um, we couldn't add the same contract. That's the only reason why it's in a different contract. It handles the NFT, but at the same time, it handles permissions. Um, and the interesting uh, thing we added is that we added support for e EAP 2612. Basically, that's uh, permits. So we added permit for NFT transfers and for permissions. So with a signature, you can provide, you can assign permissions to different people. Mm -hmm. instead of having to execute transactions for each one. That was pretty cool, actually. Yeah. Um, then we have oracles. Like we said, we wanted anyone to be able to execute swaps, so we need a source of truth um, and to determine what the price of the oracle is. Um, basically, there are other solutions that are far more flexible than main finance in the sense that they support a lot of other tokens that we don't. And, and that's because sometimes they don't use on-chain oracles. They just execute whatever they have, whatever is available, I don't know, on an aggregator like, like Paraswap or Uniswap or whatever. That allows them to support a lot of tokens that we can support because we need oracles. Mm. But at the same time, that requires a lot of trust in them to execute the swaps correctly on them to make sure that they don't get sandwich or that they don't get, um, uh, I don't know, they don't choose a path with few liquidity that that requires an, an amount of trust that's um, really big. So we went with this approach. I mean, the, the idea of oracles. Um, then positioned aggregators, just two more things and then we can dive into the code, but this is very important to understand how min can scale. So basically, um, we needed to, uh, to aggregate all positions in one transaction. We can't iterate through all of them mm. because that would be, of course, very expensive. 
So yeah, basically, you, don't, you want to avoid the for loop, right? Ex exactly. I mean, if you have a for loop on some, <laughs> and and you don't you don't control the amount of things you are iterating, then that's a big red flag. Yeah. Um, so basically, what we realize is okay. Let's assume that these prices, I mean, they each swap. This was the price of if when I when I wrote this this presentation a while ago. <laughs> It was much, <laughs> uh, was more expensive. Um, so basically, let's say somebody enters a position and these swaps are executed each day. For someone that ends it, uh, entered in swap one and, and swapped two ETH for three days, basically their swap balance would be two ETH for the amount of die, plus two ETH for this amount of die, plus two ETH for this amount of die. That was the rates that were executed, right? Um, so basically, we realize, okay, we can take the rate out. So basically, the swap balance would be the rate multiplied by this, the, the sum of all the, the rates, the ratios um, during swaps. So we realize this and say, hey, what if we were to actually store this, this sum so we could actually calculate it. We don't need to iterate at all. Mm -hmm. We just need to, we, with this simple math, we can actually calculate how much you should get in return based on your rate and this value that we will uh, have already stored. Yeah, you know, I always say if you have an, a for loop that uh, that is that could theoretically be infinite on chain, you probably should have to look at your architecture again, right? And this is one solution to that. Yeah, yeah, hundred percent. I mean, you you need to be very careful where where iterating. So basically, going back to a previous example, we have a variable called Akim ratio. So basically, it says for Accumulate ratio for the first swap would be this amount. For the second one would be this one and this one. We're accumulating the ratio between them. So basically, the math is just um, it's just calculate the difference between the accumulations and multiply it by the the rate. That's basically it. I mean, this is a simplified version, of course. There are a few minor things to consider, but basically, with this uh, with this logic we can actually know how much each user should get without having to iterate at any point in time. And then um, how would we determine how much we need to swap in each swap? <laughs> I mean, again, if we were to iterate through all positions, it would be very, very expensive really fast. So basically we have two different variables. We have an amount to swap where we add the rate in each deposit. And then we also do something else is, let's say we have these two, uh, I mean, this variable here, and somebody makes a deposit that says, I want to swap uh, 100 die for five swaps, then we will add the 100 die to the amount to swap, but we will also, after five swaps, store some delta here. That means that once we execute all these swaps, we need to remember to subtract this amount from amount to swap. So basically, on each swap, we look at this value and say, okay, here I have some value, I need to subtract it for amount to swap. So basically, um, again, we don't need to iterate over anything, which is some, we just count all the amount to swap on this variable, and when we get to to this particular swap, when this position ended, we just remember that we need to subtract this 100 from the amount to swap. That's basically it. With these two tricks, <laughs> uh, we can actually support, again, 100 or a million different positions on the same pair. That's, that's so awesome. Um, could you maybe go a couple of slides back to the to the Oracle slides? Because I think your Oracle architecture is also really interesting to look at. Uh, the one with the diagram. Mm, yes, this one? 
Uh, no, there was the other one where you have the Uniswap compared to the chain link. No, it wasn't actually the diagram. It was the listing of, of the oracles. Yeah, this one. Okay. Okay, so the Uniswap V3 obviously is the TWAP, uh, TWAP oracle, so you need a lot of liquidity for that. Um, would be very interesting to look at the implementation, how you actually prioritize one oracle over the other uh, in the aggregator, right? Yeah. Because I don't think that's, I don't think that's trivial. Um, I'm really interested in oracles right now for obvious reasons, because Diad, a stable coin that I'm building, right? We have this super heavy dependence on Chainlink which we want to get rid of. So I'm really interesting and uh, really interested in that part too. Yeah, sure. But yeah, really, really great overview, uh, Nico. Let's, but now for the exciting part, let's jump, let's jump into code. Yeah, sure. Um, do you want to go over the DCA part, the Oracle's part? You, you tell me. Let's start with the DCA hub. Can you read there or should I zoom in? Uh, you are still sharing the slides. Okay. Now? Now you are sharing nothing. <laughs> 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 oh, because I was, okay. Let me share it. Let me share. Entire screen. There we go. Do you see it now? It's loading. Yeah. No. Right. Do you see it, or should I, should I zoom in a little bit? Maybe zoom in a little bit. Sure thing. So basically, this is the DCA hub. Um, this is the DCA hub. What we actually did is we separated each concern into different subcontracts. So for example, we have the swap handler that's, that is in charge of everything related to swaps from determining how much you need in exchange for what um actually executing swaps and storing everything related to that. Then we have the position handler that actually uh, handles positions, creation, uh, uh, deposits, withdraws, uh, uh, modifies, uh, all or that. Then we have, uh, for example, the config handler. This is just basically handles all the config, allows certain roles to change Oracle, to change fees and all that. Um, this is just basically something to write and, and read configuration. And then we have the parameters that the, just this one just holds all the information mm -hmm. that, that is shared across the other contracts um, that allows us to, to share the information between them. That's basically, we decided to structure it so we could um, separate concerns and test them individually. Um, because if we were to write everything in one contract, it would be really easy to get lost really soon. Yeah. So yeah, basically that's what we did. Um, so basically if we look at the code, let's say the position handler, the position handler uh, knows the permission manager. Um, then we also store user positions, user positions, basically this struct. Basically, we keep track of the swap where each position was last modified, the swap where that position would end, the swap interval that we decided to store it in one byte instead of using, instead of storing the the swap interval in in a new in 32, we decided to reduce it to to one byte just to keep things uh, in one slot. 
the from token, the to token, and we also decided to split the rate into two different um, variables, so we could have two different, uh, we could have it in two, two storage slots. If you were to actually uh, do make make it like this, then this wouldn't fit in one in one storage slot, so it would be it would be like slot one, slot two, and slot three. That's of course more expensive. So we say, well, let's do it like this. And so we have now slot one, and here we have slot two. So it's fairly cheaper just to split the rate um, like this. Yeah. Um, so basically, we have well, the user position just um, gets based on a position ID returns the, the full data for that position. We have uh, deposits where we check that the smart contract hasn't been paused. We do some checks like you are not actually trying to to deposit into the zero address. Um, we check that both tokens are whitelisted. Um, mm. We build that position that basically we build the struct. We check um, that the swap interval you are using is actually supported. Um, then we call the permission manager to, hey, let's mint the NFT for this position for this user. Um, yeah, maybe maybe interesting for some for some uh, viewers. Line seventy three is where you start to do some uh, some bit operations, right? Yeah, um, and you do that throughout the code. So, for example, in the permission permission manager, how you manage the permissions is also a place where you use one byte to store all the different permissions, which, which I think is interesting. It's actually something that I copied over uh, <laughs> for something that I was working on. Yeah, so basically we realized, I mean, going back to Permission Manager, we realized, okay, um, we, with a certain permission, we had, I mean, we had four different permissions, right? Like uh, mo uh, increase, reduce, withdraw, and terminate. We didn't need to have, I mean, <laughs> with one byte, that's more than enough. Um, yeah. So we said, the okay, native, uh, sorry, Nico, the native approach would be to have four booleans, right? That would be the, uh, the, the bad approach, basically, or the easy one. Yeah, I mean, that's, of course, that, can, that could happen. But we, we realized, OK, we can, if we, if you will use a little math, then we can do checks Save a, a lot of storage yeah, and, re yeah. and reduce storage. So basically, um, what we actually did it here is actually pretty interesting, but going back, when we actually send permissions, um, you send permissions and so you say, okay, um, this permission, we convert it to, to, to uh, you in, like we said, and we store it with the block number. Why do we store it with the block number? Because we realized that if I were to transfer the NFT to you, then all people who had permissions uh, before uh, should lose their permissions. I mean, each time an NFT is transferred, permissions should be revoked. So the new owner can be rest assured that they are the only ones um, who can access that position. So we realized that it would be very expensive for us to keep track of to have a list of all positions that were of all permissions that were assigned to a position so we could just revoke them so we realized that we could actually do something so a little smarter that is we will store when a position was given and we will update um, when a, a, a position has been transferred so basically if you have a permission that was assigned to you before that uh, position was transferred, then that permission no longer exists and it's no longer valid. By doing that, we didn't need to iterate through all assigned permissions on each transfer. 
Um, so, so maybe to summarize what, what Nico is saying, I, I own an NFT, right? And I put some permissions on the NFT. And now I transfer it over. You want to revoke those permissions, right? Otherwise, you could do anything with them. Yeah. Um, maybe one downside uh, from this implementation is that I don't think you can uh, mint an NFT and give permissions in the same block, right? Right, you can't. Mm. Yeah. Actually, that's something that <laughs> it's a really good point. Let me check the line of code that because actually what we realize is when you are when we are actually checking for permissions, we check that the last ownership. I mean, we check that you actually have permissions and that the last ownership change was before the token permission was last updated. Um, what we actually did we, before this, this was actually an, an mm. it was like this. And we realized that we could, on the same block, assign permissions and then transfer the yes. transfer it to you. Um, and by doing that, uh, this didn't work. Um, mm -hmm. uh, so basically, it was a, like a security issue that I could assign permissions and transfer it to you in the same block. So and that wouldn't get revoked. So we realized that we wanted to go with this. But going back to your question, when you mint something, you can set permissions on that same block. I mean, this check does, does take into account when it was minted uh, on the same, I mean, you can mint and assign permissions on the same block. You can't transfer and assign permissions on the same block. Mm. Okay, so there is like an extra if else if it's minted, then we do this this extra logic. That's a, that's actually because we don't uh, we don't modify the last ownership change on mm. mint. We just mm. modify on transfer. Okay. okay. So so basically, if you go, it was here. See, is if from if token is being okay. mint, there's no need to write it. So basically, you can mint and assign. You can't transfer and assign. Okay. Okay. Um, so yeah, this was actually fairly cool. So basically, this is how we handle permissions. Um, what we are BCA have what actually does is when somebody calls um, modify, then they call the permission manager and say, hey. This address is looking to modify this position and they want to do a, a withdraw. Is mm -hmm. that okay or not? We check if the if the address is in fact the owner, then yes, they're good to go. If not, we check if they have been given permission and if they have been given permission, if it was given before it was last uh, mm -hmm. updated. That's basically what we do with permissions. Fairly easy. I mean, it has some tricks here and there, but... <laughs> But yeah, basically it, it, it works. Um, going back to position handler, once the NFT is minted and permissions are assigned, what we actually do then is we basically um, call the Oracle and let it know, hey, well, let me just go here. We call the Oracle and say, hey, um, add support for this pair if, if needed, if we need to. Um, Please add support for it, and because some oracles like Uniswap V3 need some initialization um, beforehand, so they can be used. So basically, each time a position is created, we call the oracle and let it know that we want to use that that pair, so we can do some initialization if needed. If it's not needed, they will just ignore everything. And then um, once the oracle is created, we add the, the rates to the delta, like we showed before. And then we just simply um, uh, store the position and take the funds from the user. Mm -hmm. Something that's come up before and is that people had told us, hey, you should check your balance before you do the check balance here and then uh, check balance here and make sure you got the amount you expected. Yeah. Um, some people recommend that. In particular, 
we decided not to do that because we, since we have the whitelist, we can make sure that tokens work as expected. Yeah, this um, is an interesting point, Nico. Uh, the the problem the problem here is um, tokens that have a fee, right, on transfer. This is the this is the problem here, um, and and it's hard, right? I had this discussion recently on Twitter, and someone was like, "If USDT or USDC introduces a fee tomorrow, half of DeFi breaks." Yeah, right? Which... <laughs> I think I was the one. Who, I think I was the one who answered that. You you said that? Okay, that's, yeah, yeah. That's funny. And, uh, yeah, yeah, you did, you did, that's right. And, and it's so true, right? Because of something like that. That's, that's the, the problem. Because even if you have a whitelisting system, if in the life cycle of the token it introduces a fee, something like that will break. The thing is that even if we did the check here, uh, if somebody, if the token was a fee on transfer, then we still wouldn't, it will still mess up our math during swaps. Um, mm. I mean, if the token is a, has a fee or it's a re-raising token, then it wouldn't work with our approach because we can, like, like I explained, we can scale mainly because we have some interesting math and that math wouldn't work if balances can change uh, without uh, us knowing so. So if it has some fee on transfer, if it's a replacing token, it won't work for us um, mm. because it, in order for it to work, we would need to uh, take these tokens into account and treat them separately. And that would be like really expensive for us. We wouldn't be able to aggregate everything together. Um, so basically we said, okay, we won't check any balance here. We will whitelist tokens that, that, uh, ha that fulfill the ERC20 uh, interface exactly um, and we will check each one of them to make sure if USDC activates a fee in the future that's okay we won't be able to to support it and I mean it would it would break most of DeFi actually if, if you ask me but uh, at the same time it would break mean so that's basically why we decided not to check balances here mm -hmm. okay um, then, like I said, if we, if somebody wants to, um, if somebody wants to withdraw, we go to execute withdraw and execute withdraw, like I mentioned before, we call, um, we make sure that the position has permission to actually withdraw. Uh, we calculate how much, um, was swapped, um, and we, and we basically will send it to to them. Um, so here we we also support withdraw swap many. That is, if you want to actually withdraw from many positions at the same time. Um, if you want to terminate a position, we actually we again check that you have position, you have permissions to terminate, and then we calculate how much was swapped, how much remains unswapped, and send both those um, values to you. Um, and when you terminate, we burn the NFT. You can increase the position, you can reduce it. Basically what we, you would expect from some account management, um, some position management. Um, and like I explained before, if you go to the interesting part here, this is the more complex version <laughs> of what I explained before. Mm -hmm. of how we look at a cum ratio that is the uh, the sum of all the ratios so we look into it when the swap was last updated we look into it uh, the newest sub to consider we subtract the both accumulations so we will be left with the accumulation between where the user last withdrew or where they entered the position and the one where the where we are right now or the position has ended. So basically this smart math uh, allows us to avoid having to iterate through all positions um, by just storing this accumulation. Mm -hmm. um, so that's basically it for position management. And then we have the other interesting part is 
the swap management. This is basically um, this is basically what happens. Um, what we do here is we support um, multi what we call multi swaps. What is multi swaps? Multi swaps are actually uh, we want to support multiple pair swaps in one place, um, in one transaction. So basically, here you will say, okay, I want to execute uh, swaps for all these pairs. How much do I need, and how much will, um, and how much will I get in return? Mm -hmm. All that magic happens here. We do this internally. You don't have to do it outside because, as we can handle this internally. We, don't, we can save a lot of gas in token transfers because if we were to handle all of these externally, then you would need to get multiple transfers from the same token and then do that math by yourself. And we said, okay, if we do it, if we do it internally, then we can actually send you exactly the, the aggregated amount of tokens. And this is what allows us to execute we sometimes execute 42 pairs in one transaction um, because it's fairly cheap for us. When we actually choose how many, which pairs to choose, we check all of them and we see which ones uh, would um, would um, have more much much better with other pairs, so that we can reduce the amount of uh, actually swaps we need to to find liquidity mm -hmm. so, so that makes everything far far cheap for us um so basically we don't we not only aggregate all positions in the same pair i mean we do but we also try to aggregate all pairs together in one transaction so basically right now we can support we can execute like thousands uh, of positions and and maybe 50 pairs we support right now we cannot execute all of them in one transaction or maybe two if it goes over the max gas limit that's what allows me to scale that's what allows us to actually execute pairs that are both profitable and unprofitable because mm -hmm. when you group everything together um the gas costs are still pretty cheap and even of course, they are on Polygon, but even on Optimism, Arbitrum, um, chains that are maybe not as cheap, but we can also have some, make all the, the swaps profitable for us or for whoever executes the swap. Okay, so basically, so the first problem was eliminating the for loop over all positions. Then you had a system where you can execute basically on pooled liquidity. And this is the next step where you actually do multiple swaps of the pooled liquidity inside one transaction. Exactly. So basically we have a lot of levels of aggregation yeah. <laughs> in order. I mean, again, this is just to make swaps cheap because if swaps were expensive, then executing um, them would be... I mean, the more expensive swaps are, the more likely it is for some swaps and so some swaps, uh, some pairs to be unprofitable. So mm -hmm. we put a lot of focus on making sure that swaps were as cheap as possible. We also have some ideas for future versions that could even make it go even cheaper. But basically we realized we need to aggregate all tokens in one swap if we want to be able to, to to make swaps cheap, so uh, swaps wouldn't be unprofitable for, for whoever executes them. Because the worst thing that will happen is that somebody creates a position and it never gets executed. Yeah. And, and Or some other platforms have a minimum uh, liquidity requirement of $100 just to, for you to, ex to create your, your position, and we didn't want to, to do that. So that's why we put so much focus on aggregation, aggregation, aggregation. Um, no, that's, uh, that's, that's really cool. Um, yeah, do, do you know how much 
uh, how much it costs currently for for a multi multi swap like this on mainnet? Um, we can check fairly easy. I think we, that would be interesting. Let me check. Uh, is he have? I have, I have the address here. Let's check, I don't know, on Arbitrum, R, RV scan. Uh, RV scan, yeah. Okay, we should have a swap here. Mm, but this is doesn't have too many. This is fairly recent. Let's go well back. Here. Oh, here we have a few subs. Here we go. Oh, it looks good. If you see here, we have like 108 token transfers. Okay. This means that we we are doing a lot of stuff. <laughs> That's yeah. that's that's great, man. That's really cool. This means uh, that um, basically, oh, let me let me try to find. I have we have this channel. Yeah, I when, think if you if you just scroll down, it would be interesting to look at the gas uh, the gas spent. Yeah, yeah, but for example, let me. We have something like this. This is optimism, for example, yesterday, and we have, uh, oh my God, it was so big, 161 positions, 54 pairs, the, the, and the gas cost was only $3. Wow. 54 pairs. I think that's a new record, actually. So if we look into it, we see that it was a lot of different transactions, basically we, because we have... Like I said, we have 52 pairs, so we have to swap everything. <laughs> um, but we aggregate them together. We actually have some yield sources that we need to unwrap, then swap it, then maybe wrap it again. But if you like, I mean, we have 56 pairs and everything is done in only one transaction. Mm. And could, could, you, could you scroll down and uh, what is the gas spent? Like, uh, 12 million. Okay. Okay. That's a bit of gas. <laughs> yeah, that's a lot of gas. Uh, <laughs> that's actually quite a lot of gas. But actually, if you look into it, we realize that there are a lot of things we can do to improve. But we realize that actually a lot of the gas costs actually come from um fetching calculating the quotes between pairs mm -hmm. so basically when you try to f to figure out what the current price of a token is if you use chain link of use uniswap you need to request um that a quote to them and we realized that when we were aggregating uh, stuff uh, before executing swaps but we were never aggregating swap um, pairs at the Oracle level. So for example, you could be asking for a quote between Dai and ETH, and you also would be asking for a quote between Dai and Wrap BTC. And you would also be asking for a quote between maybe ETH and Wrap BTC. Hmm. That doesn't, I mean, that's another level of aggregation we could add, <laughs> where we actually just fetch the price not between not between a, a specific token but you can i don't know price try to prior everything against eth or against a usd or whatever and then um you can calculate the the quotes between pairs but you all but you only needed to ask the oracles uh, just once we realized that i don't know 30, 40% of the gas costs were actually going to asking for the same quotes multiple times. Mm -hmm. um, so we realized that we now need to build an Oracle aggregator 
aggregator. <laughs> I mean, we need to aggregate uh, the possibility to ask for quotes for multiple pairs at the same time. Hmm. Um, I think it's, it's, this is stuff that you realize once it, everything is in production, of course. It's very yeah. hard to, to see, to try to see everything beforehand. But yeah, we realized that we could, we could just, um, if we were to do that and some other things we have planned, like a new version should be a lot, a lot cheaper and we could actually execute more swaps. But actually being able to execute, I don't know, it was, I think it was like a hundred positions, a hundred something positions, 52 pairs in one transaction. That's incredible. <laughs> Yeah, no, for for sure. Maybe another thing, I'm I'm really impressed by twelve million gas for four dollars. I didn't realize how cheap L twos are are right now. That's crazy. Yeah, yeah, and and bed bedrock is should even make things cheaper. And um, look at the amount of the compression also. Like L one gas used by transaction hundred k. So also also impress also impressive. Okay. Should we should we jump back again? This was a adventure. Yeah. Yeah. And <laughs> yeah. So basically, uh, what we do here is like I explained, we go through each pair, and then we calculate how much we need to swap for each pair, and then we uh, calculate the total for each token. So we know that for token A, um, we want we will have all that needs to be swapped for it. And then uh, once we have, and we also calculate how much we need. So basically we go through each pair and we will um, sum up how much we need and how much we have. So once we, we have that, we can say, okay, less, um, we know how much we need, we know how much we have, if we just, calculate the difference, then we know if this token in particular is something that needs to be provided or if it's something that needs to be returned as a reward. So that's basically what we do here. We say, okay, this token is a reward because the difference is positive and this uh, token needs to be provided because the difference was negative. Um, so basically, we by doing this, we, we give the contract. You, here you have 52 pairs calculate how much I need um, how much I need to for each token so basically anybody can call this and they will get um, the, the amount they need and the amount they will get in return and they can prepare a swap that will meet that demand because what we actually do, right now and what other people do when they execute swaps is you get this information and you say, okay, um, now that I have this information, we can, I can prepare swaps using different aggregators like one inch or zero X, para swap, whatever, and find the best price. So that I, based on what I get as a reward, I can get the, the amount of tokens I need. That's basically what we and other people do when they execute swaps. Okay. And then basically when we actually execute a swap, we check, we get the, the swap information, and then we just go through each one of the swaps that was executed and just, um, just register the swaps, like saying, okay, this swap was executed, we should store the ratio between the tokens so that then we can calculate the swapped amount for each one. Um, and, that, and then here we check that the tokens were returned. I mean, we have, we store the balance. I mean, before we actually execute the swaps, we store how much we have um, as a balance. Um, so then we can execute the swap and then we check, okay, let's make sure that the current balance is exactly uh, what we need, if not fail. Hmm. And that's basically it. I mean, that's uh, basically what 
our DCI platform does right now. It's just calculate how much we need for our multi swaps and then simply store the store everything so we can keep track of it and then send the users the funds and then make sure that we got we got what we expected back no oh, awesome dude uh there's still some interesting stuff left so for example the oracle aggregator but I'm looking at the time, we're at like an hour and 10 minutes, so I think let's, uh, let's pause it here. Okay. Uh, but but maybe, maybe we do a part two soon. I think that would be, would be super cool as well. Um, Miku, man, thanks for, thanks for taking the time and uh, for, the, for the great uh, code walkthrough. Happy, happy to be here. And any questions you or anybody might have, our Discord is wide open. Happy to explain it, go over it. Um, and even if you have some suggestions, we're completely open to it. We can consider it for the next version. Awesome. Yeah, guys, thanks for tuning into the first episode of the Bytecode. As Nico said, uh, join the Mean Finance Discord. Follow them on Twitter. Uh, it's the DCA platform to use if you want a DCA in a decentralized way. All right. See you guys soon. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.